to lead us this month in communion and ask Lady Esther to continue to play in our communion time. So, Pastor John, would you come lead the congregation in the Lord's Supper? Good morning, all you lovely people. That includes you too, uh, Bobby. Appreciate that. Got up this morning and the uh, pastor said, hey, uh, we need you. So here I am. This is our seventh year since retiring from this church. It's hard to believe that all those years have gone by. And we've served in a number of different churches as transition pastor. And uh, I've enjoyed it greatly. The Lord has given us uh, some real wonderful opportunities. None of the churches shrank. <laughs> they all grew, which was a good thing. Sometimes churches need help. And we've been uh, in contact with yet another church. <clears throat> this one a little closer to home. We'll talk about that more someday, but right now, we encourage you to pray for us because we're, this is still our home church and we're a missionary going out from this congregation. I was waiting in the car this morning for my wife to come uh, out of the house and get in the car and the way we're gonna go to here. And next door, we have a Christian family of Vietnamese people, the molten yards, the ones that uh, all got kicked out of there when the war was over. And uh, they're all standing around, four, four of the men, three of the men, standing around the front of a car, an old one. And they're And so uh, I walked over and I kind of looked along with them, what's under the hood here, and I said, you know, fellas, this is, uh, this looks like either an exorcism or, um, uh, well, it, it, it could be a funeral, um, or it could be uh, a resurrection, because that car's been sitting there for a while. And one of them said, no, no, those are all reasonable things, but what this is, is a diagnosis. Now, that's what this is designed to be. The communion table is not only remembering Christ, but using what he said as a diagnosis for us. Where's our heart? What are we doing or not doing? Someone wants to find sin as active or passive. Let me get take this thing off. Is it is active or passive rebellion against God? There's a lot of people struggling with that today, more so than I think at any recent time that, that I can remember or from my experience. And what he wants us to do at the communion table is look inside. How is it, how's that heart doing? We're not talking about cardiology here. We're talking about soteriology or the, the study of salvation. Jesus came to give us liberty and freedom. Freedom from fear, liberty from the oppressive nature of sin. And, and when we come to the communion table, we look back at what Jesus was doing with his disciples and he said, look, I, I'm gonna die for you and I want you to take full advantage of what that means. It means forgiveness of sin to those who will admit that they're sinners. That diagnosis then becomes extremely important. Are we, are we ready? So I'm gonna ask the elders or the um, those who are going to be distributing to come forward, please. And we're going to consider these things. You'll note that there's both a um, juice 
and a bread. And you're to take each of them together. All right? We're not going to go by twice. We're going to cut down on the personal contact stuff. Okay? Keeping the distance. And if you'll take a moment in your own heart, your private thoughts with God and ask, have I done what I need to do? Have I expressed a willingness to stop doing what I shouldn't do? And if you ask for the grace of God to give you the power to do the right thing, and have you taken the blood of Jesus to cleanse for that sin? If you haven't, do it now. And then you can take this bread and cup. But if you're unwilling to do that, then I would say pass it by. Give him an opportunity to work in your life and heart. Let this be a a new day, a renewed day. And he wants to do that every time you come to the table. He wants to do that every time you come to prayer. Keep short accounts. Gentlemen, would you pass the cup? And if I might just say a few more words while this cup and bread are coming your way. It's a pleasure serving the Lord. It's amazing the strength he gives. We were asked to fill in at church a couple of weeks ago for a pastor who had COVID. His whole family did, and all the leadership in the church, except one, was um, quarantined. <laughs> Made a, for a very interesting situation. Who's going to take the offering? Who, who's going to be at the door? Uh, who's going to make the decisions? Who's going to be in the sound booth? Wow. So... Uh, They all kind of looked at me kind of blank when I got into the pulpit. I said, well, Lord, this is the time we need your grace. Forgive us. Forgive us us sinners. Give us strength and give us your direction. And uh, so I'm looking down and said, who's going to take you over there and you over there and you over there? You're going to get to take the offering this morning. And and you over there, this is this lady. And she yells out, praise the Lord. I've wanted to always take the offering, and this is my opportunity. And she yelled it out as top as she could. And it was a joyful moment. Everybody laughed, and then they clapped. Sometimes difficult situations is a time when God shines. He shines indeed. Well, it looks like we're going to have to put that one down below because there's not enough for everybody. Oh, you're going to take that. You got, you're okay? She's okay? Oh, there's one left. Oh, yes. He took the bread and he broke it. This is my body, which is broken for you. I've done this for you. Don't waste it. Don't let it happen for nothing. Brothers and sisters, you're going to take this, take this bread now, put it inside, and then realize that this is going to go into your physical body. Your body's going to digest it, and it's going to put it in different places in your body, and your body's going to use it. And the same is true for the flesh of Jesus Christ. He died. Embrace it. Take it into your life. Let it have the impact that it was designed to have. And then, this is, (laughs) this is the blood of Christ. It's what cleanses that which is so dark and rich and red makes us whiter than snow. Oh, brothers and sisters, let's drink of it together. Remembering that this is for forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin. Amen. Pastor. Thank you, brother. 
such rich symbolism in the story of God's redemption. So many things are types. There are words that are shadows of, there are pointers to. And we have them throughout the entire Scripture. You know, a lamb slain, we know that's about Christ. You know, a covering, we know that's about God's covering of our sin. The cup is the, is the blood, it's a symbol of what Christ did. So many beautiful and rich symbols. Uh, one of those is uh, oh, sheep. We are all sheep. And we all make mistakes. All we like sheep have gone astray. I was watching um, the Clarkson Farm, I think it's called. If you ever watched Top Gear and those three British guys are always racing cars and checking out cars? Well, Clarkson, he decided to buy a 900-acre farm. He knows nothing about farming. It's hilarious to watch him. He got a, a whole flock of sheep, and he decided to get a remote control you know, helicopter with the sound of a dog barking <laughs> to try to herd his sheep. It didn't go over so well. Sheep are going to do what sheep do, <laughs> and we do what we do. Today we're kind of looking at a moment in time where we lost innocence, when we chose to do something we shouldn't have done. The series in Genesis is all about God's blessings, but it's also about betrayal and brokenness. And that, this chapter, chapter 3 in Genesis, is quite a bit the story of the entire Bible. <laughs> it's a little mini picture of the entirety of Scripture, and I want to look at that today. You know, I'm on Facebook in a bunch of groups, and uh, I'm a big Star Trek fan. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. I've gone to all the movies. Uh, my friend and I, uh, many years ago, would go to the movies and would have our Star Trek gear on. I'm a geek. It's true. I really am. <laughs> But I saw an interesting thing on the universe, uh, Star Trek Universe group, and believe it or not, it was written by a guy named Buck Rogers, so <laughs> that's kind of funny in itself. But he says this, watching Star Trek VI tonight, and I found myself subconsciously looking for plot holes. That isn't like me. A lot of us do that now, I think. How do we turn that off? Criticism is second nature now, and I really don't like that about myself. I bit apples at one point, and I'm sad now. I don't know. Funny YouTube reviews, negative Facebook groups, maybe a whole mesh of stuff. Maybe it was the 2009 Star Trek reboot that I'm upset about and unlocked it. I don't know. But I wish it would stop. I want to be a kid again and be amazed. Do you remember innocence? Do you remember when you were innocent? I don't know if you have those memories because usually you'd have to go all the way back to very, very early childhood when you didn't quite have an understanding of the ramifications of your choices. But there's a moment in time when you realize, I've done something, and there's consequences, and things aren't the way they used to be. And throughout our life, we discover by choices, by moving into one lane or another lane, and we realize, oh, I wish I had never experienced that. I've lost my innocence. The Bible gives us a beautiful picture of innocence. And I want to talk about the truth about nakedness. That's what this text is about, what nakedness means in the heart of man and what it meant in the Garden of Eden that innocence was lost because eyes were opened. Deuteronomy 1.39 says, and the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from bad. Matthew 19, Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them, for they're such belong the kingdom of heaven. And then again in chapter 18 of Matthew, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. We've got to find this place of innocence, of complete faith and wonder in the relationship we have with God and all those other things are like guilt washed away. 
but innocence is gone. Beautiful gift from God, a relationship with mankind. It began, it began un, with sweet, unadulterated walking with the Lord. It started with a massive blessing. It was all very good. And they walked and they talked with the Lord. And God gave blessings. And let me tell you something. God gives blessings to you and I. And we need to look for those things. But if we go all the way back to the very beginning, God gave blessings. It was a blessing of bounty. And I think sometimes we, even though we look back at Adam and Eve in that moment, there are mirrors in our life where God has blessed us, and yet we've lost it. And we've even forgotten about His blessings, but the first thing God gave them was a blessing of bounty. Chapter 2 said God took the man and put him in the garden to cultivate it and tend to it, and the Lord commanded the man, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat. Have at it. Enjoy the animals. Name them. Enjoy life in the garden. Let's walk together, talk together. It's great, beautiful, you're blessed. But he also gave him the blessing of boundaries. We live in a time and place where boundaries are not liked. In the last 40 years, boundaries for children being raised were not even set. We don't set boundaries. Let them be free for all. See what happens. And now we have these people running the show with no boundaries. He said, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for on that day you eat it, you will certainly die. You see, before they sinned, before they ate from that tree, they were innocent. They didn't have an evil inclination. It didn't exist in them. There's no evil in them to even consider, oh, I'm going to do wrong. I'm going to do it. The evil inclination came from an outside source tempting them, moving them through that, and they caught on that because God did give them free will to choose. But they were not evil. It wasn't in them. But once they'd taken the fruit that had been forbidden, the innocence was lost. Genesis 2 says, and the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. They saw nothing wrong with absolute innocence and openness. There was nothing tainted in any way, shape, or form. Nothing had been broken. Chapter 3, verse 7 says, and then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. Verse 11 says, he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? See, I want to just capture this moment that before they partook of what was forbidden and this blessing of a boundary, everything was beautiful. And there was nothing in them that would move that direction towards evil. But the moment they succumbed to temptation, their eyes was open about what was good and what was wrong. And they saw their nakedness, which never was meant to be bad. And nakedness just re- represents everything that is beautiful that can be broken by disobedience. That path from innocence to brokenness, you know, it's there for us all. It's kind of a tragedy when we come to a stage when we see all for what it is and we take a look at this and we, we see it all. And I can point there and point there and point there and say, that's broken, rather than look at that and go, oh my goodness. We can look back at that fateful moment, and it all went wrong. So the question, are we prone for betrayal? God made Adam in the image of him, and he made mankind, and Seth was born, and Cain and Abel were born in the image of Adam. Are we prone to betrayal? Genesis 3 says as an outside source, some serpent, which is more cunning than any animal in the field, and the Lord God had made. No, what is this serpent? Is it Satan? Some think so. Some think it's just a creation of God. Certainly he can talk. It's, a, it's an interesting thing what this thing is. It's obviously got legs because they're removed and he goes to the earth. But was the serpent evil? If the serpent is not Satan, 
And I don't believe it is because the Bible says it's like into one of the beasts of the field. It's something that God had made that was there in the garden. But it's simply a part of his creation. Still, there's an aspect that we have to think about. It was not a supernatural being, but Satan used it. Somehow, centered, Satan entered into the body of the serpent to tempt Adam and Eve. Whatever this creature was, it was used by the devil to bring temptation from an outside source. And we can see this in the Scripture all over the place where sent, Satan entered Judas. Satan entered Peter. Satan had already betrayed God and was set to destroy God's plan for beauty and relationship with mankind. And so Satan is against God's beautiful innocence. And he just tweaks. And how does he do that? Tempting. We are all tempted. Do I give grief to Adam and Eve for being tempted? I do not. Do I can Dem them for choosing what they did? I do not. Because I have done the same. I've lost innocence. Temptation comes from Satan, yes. It, it comes from my own sinful cravings, which is as a result of Satan's sin that is in me like any other human being is prone toward doing our own thing. I'm tempted by societal Enticements as they bring something up and you need this, you need that, you're better if you're this, you're better if you're that. American church driven by greed and acquisition rather than by sacrifice, exchanging one for another, we're built for it, makes it easy to break the law. Andrew Murray was a South African pastor and a great writer of the 19th century and into the early uh, 20th century. He asked the question of a New Testament church that's received Christ and has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. He says, if the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, why do we still succumb to temptation? We got the power of the Holy Spirit to say no. Adam didn't have that. We have that. So why? And he said four letters S E L F. Self. It's always about a choice for self. What I desire, what I delight in. And that's what happens in this story of Adam and Eve. James 1 says we're all tempted. But it says when you're tempted, no one should say God's tempted me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. We have a desire. It entices us. The temptation, we look at it, oh, I want that, I want that. It entices us to it. And then after we do that, we sin, and then we're dead, and innocence is gone. Jesus said in Luke, pray that you will not fall into temptation. In fact, even in the Lord's Prayer, he says these words, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's important for us to deal with the temptation factor in our lives. It's there it's there. If you deny that the world brings about temptation, the enemy brings about temptation, you're not enticed here or there in some things. It might be something small. It might be something huge. But temptation is present. I have good news. Paul writes in Corinthians, the first book of Corinthians, that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. But God's faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Would you hear that? You will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. What does that tell me? I don't have to do that. I'm not dragged into that. I have a choice not to sin. 
You see what it says there? The temptation's gonna come, but there is another choice that I do not sin in the face of temptation. A lot of people, a lot of Christians say, well, I was just drawn, I couldn't control it. It was just too much for me. I'm here to tell you, you could have said no. We should have said no. But it goes on. When you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God will be there. There's this temptation all around. What it leads to betrayal. From this blessed state we're in the, with the Lord, and this betrayal is first of all in belief, and that's what the enemy is doing. Is what do you really believe? What have you really heard? Genesis 3, and I'm not going to read the entire text of everything. You can look at it. It'll be on the board. Capture it. But I want to point out some things that the first thing the enemy said, this serpent, whatever his enticement was, whatever his temptation was, whatever control he had by Satan, whatever it was, he questioned what God had said, and he made her question what God has said. Is that really what you believe? Has God really said that? She said, God has said it. He said, did he really say you're going to die? God knows what he knows. He knows what you don't, what he doesn't want you to have, but you really should have. What's he holding back from you? Did he say it? Yeah. He did. He said, you'll become like God. Is that true? Yes. Yes. So your eyes will be open. Is that true? Yes. Knowing good and evil, is that true? Yes. You will surely die. Is that true? The answer is yes, but what was the serpent doing? Did he mean it? Did God say it? He said it, but did he, did he really mean it? The enemy is all about half-truths, about twisting it. Are you going to die? You're not going to die, but they did die. Death physically, but more than that, death spiritually. They didn't have that concept. What does death spiritually mean? Let alone death physically. With your eyes wide open, they were open. Open to what? To what the result of evil will do. It got open. We know that later on, Jesus says, God says, they've become like us. Are you like God? Yes. In what way? You now see the ramifications of evil. And the first one is, Man, I wish I didn't know that. I wish I was innocent again. I believe that these tactics are in today's world. Regarding the Bible, regarding the teachings of Christ, the church around the globe in many ways, and church in America, are walking away and saying, is this really true? Are these words really inspired? Are they really infallible? And if that's what God wants us to read, did he really mean it like that? How often we hear, hey you, Jesus said, love. Love, 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 love. And yet they walk away from the other teachings of Christ. Love gives us wisdom to choose right and wrong and to try to help people away from wrong. But they're trying to put questions. Did he really say that? Can you really trust this? And so many people who call themselves Christians are what they're known as apostate. Apostate. They've walked away from the truth. It's an apostasy. How about the nature and work of Christ? Was he really God on the cross? Was he really God at all? Does a sacrifice mean anything, really? And whether we obey him in all things or just a few things, is it all going to be good? You see, it's a crisis of belief. Be cautious, friends, because that's where the enemy is going to start. In your belief. It's not just a betrayal in belief, but then it comes to a betrayal in behavior. How we deal with sin. It says, when the woman saw the tree was good, 
for food, and this is important, it was a delight to the eyes. The tree was desirable to make one wise. And then she took it, and then she ate it, and then she gave it. What a road map to brokenness and betrayal. That looks great. It's a delight. You know, I, I kind of want that. It looks so good, I'd like, to, I'd like to try that. Let me just look at it for a while. I'm not getting too close, you know. Boy, that looks good. Let me just stay around it for a while. I'm going to dance around the parameters a little bit here. I haven't seen I'm just I'm just admiring it. I can picture Gollum. <laughs> Precious. And then she ate. And when we do wrong, a lot of things happen. People in trouble like to share their trouble. I don't want to do this alone. She gave it to her husband, and he ate it. Second Corinthians, Paul looks back at this moment. He says, but I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds might be corrupted from what? The simplicity that is Christ. He came, he loved, he died, he rose. Redemption is yours. So what happens when we sin? The first thing we do is we hide from each other. And that's what happens. Their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked and so what they do, they sewed some fig leaves together to hide themselves from the other person. You shouldn't see me like this. I don't want you to look at me like this. And we also hide from the Lord. God, don't look at me anymore. I know I've done wrong. I'm not worthy of you can come near me. I'm hiding over here. And verses 8 through 11 gives this compelling story of God saying, hey, where are you? He knew where they were. So who told you were naked? Have you eaten from it? He knew they had. But there's a moment you have to come out and reconcile with God that you have done wrong according to his word. You've betrayed in belief and you've betrayed in behavior and you have to acknowledge it. Yeah, they hide. They betrayed in belief and behavior, but they also betrayed with blame. Oh, they all blame. We're good at blaming. It's called projecting. It's called gaslighting. Sharing the, the responsibility. Don't look at me. I didn't do it. Somebody else did it. Verses 12 to 13 gives a great woman a, a picture of this. The man said, the woman whom you gave me, blaming God and blaming her. She gave me some of the fruit, and I ate it. Lord said to the woman, okay, what is it that you've done? And the woman said, hey, it's the serpent. I got twisted. I got deceived. And I ate. We like to blame. But in truth, if I look back at Adam, he sinned in a couple of ways. He was sitting around right there. He was present when the whole thing happened. We hear these stories that she went out and found Adam. But we don't see that in the text. He's right there. He's sitting there watching his wife dance around the fruit. So he sits there. And once it happens, he hides. And then he blames. Sometimes we have to say, you shouldn't be doing that. Because we sit back, whether you're male or female, and you see your spouse or a loved one, and they're going down a path. We don't need to sit there. We need to say something. Hello. Sitting there and watching the world go to pot, watching your family go down the tubes, watching your neighborhood go down, watching the country fall apart. Sitting there is not the answer. Because sin will reign. Say something. And don't hide. Don't hide from the Lord. Don't hide from each other. Step in to the gap and say, you know what? This isn't right. We shouldn't do it. I don't need to hide. I need to stand. And I don't need to blame. When I've done wrong, I will take the blame. If I've done wrong, I'll say I'm sorry. 
These betrayals of belief, behavior, and blame, they are just nothing but brokenness. And there are repercussions to our actions. Don't ever forget there are consequences to what happens. The serpent, he had a repercussion. It's a brokenness connection between the serpent and man, and this verse is all about that in 14 through 15. And I don't know what this serpent could have been, would have been, should have been, but things went south after this because now he's in the dirt and there's complete animosity between mankind and a serpent on the ground. And you see the curse given out to the serpent, and yet in there, there's a little phrase, and of your offspring, and he descendant, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. You might take a look and say, well, yeah, the serpent's down there, and I'm going to step on it, and the serpent's going to probably bite me down there. It's just kind of a, a thing. And yet, if you look at the Hebrew, that descendant, that seed, it's capitalized. It's emphasized that the seed of the woman is going to be your enemy, and he will crush you. A little glimpse of what's to come. To the woman, the repercussion, broken joy in her relationship with her husband, broken joy in the aspects of birth and in marriage. He multiplies the pain and produces a situation where her desire will be for her husband and start moving that in this ruling over thing. And we go through this all the time of submission and non-submission and we should be submitting to each other, but who's in charge, what it is. It broke right there. Man, you caused me to do this. I'm going to rule over you now. Broken. And the man, broken peace with his wife, broken relationship with his work, with the needs. Did he have to work? He was having a good time naming animals. He could go out and take any fruit, but now he's going to have to work for it. It's not going to come easy. And the needs of his family are not right in your face. They are produced by the work of your hands. Man, Adam. <laughs> but there are repercussions. Cursed is the ground because of you. Okay. They're broken, and there's repercussions about how that's going to happen, but there's a brokenness with God that happens. And this is really what happens in our life because we were created in the, in the image of God for the glory of God, for the pleasure of God. But when we sin, we are broken from relationship with God. This is a fascinating thing, and I spent a lot of time this week looking at this text in Genesis 3, verse 22. So the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like us, knowing good and evil, and now well, he might reach out with his hand and take the fruit also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And that's why he got kicked out of the garden. <laughs> okay, so he had become like God in knowing what is right and knowing what is wrong and recognizing the brokenness that comes through evil and how sad that is. And then he says if they'd taken this life, they'd be living eternally. How compassionate. How compassionate of God. That when our innocence is lost and things are falling apart, that you don't have to deal with that and endure that for eternity. It's hard enough for 70 plus years, but eternity to deal with your crime, with your sin, with your brokenness, oh my, how horrific that would have been. Now I want to fast track to Revelation because in Revelation the tree of life is there. And this bookends of you're not going to have eternal life here. Too much sin. It'll be too bad. It'll be too rough. But there is a day when you're going to have eternal life in heaven because of Christ, the seed that would break the head of the enemy. Break the chains of sin. See, God from the very beginning created a redemption plan because he's about the blessings, y'all. 
He's about blessings. Yeah, we're affected by the actions of Adam, but we live on the other side of the cross. So I can't go back to Old Testament and deal with that. I know the cross of Christ is present. It, 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 it's, the, it's the break water. It's, it's the, the levee between the storms and the safety between all of history is the cross of Christ. God covers their nakedness. You don't have to hide. You can't hide yourself. God, in the first time in creation, in all of it, He kills an animal so the skin could cover the nakedness. A temporary symbol, as I mentioned at the beginning, that God wants to cover your shame. And so he covers it right there in a moment of sacrifice that leads to the point when Christ would have to be sacrificed, and he alludes to the fact that woman's seed, and he goes through this, and we'll look at in Genesis all the way through with Abraham, with Moses. He mentions the seed all the way through, and the seed of David, and this end time when this Messiah would come to do what? To offer you once again eternal life. How beautiful is that? He promises you, he covers your sin, he covers your nakedness, and he promises you a Savior. That's the plan. That's the plan. I'm sorry that you and I, and I know I can say this faithfully without question, I'm sorry that you and I have experienced the loss of innocence. It's heavy. And if we thought on it long, it would break our heart for the things we have done or said. And not just that we broke the law of God, but we broke the heart of God. But that's not how it ends. Because in Christ, there's return to innocence. I want you to hear that. I know your mind goes back and says, I know I did these things, I remember those things, but in Christ, you're innocent. Before the judge of eternity, you'll be found not guilty. You're acquitted. No jail time for you. No consequence. You'll enter into heaven, into rest, into peace, into glory because of Christ. That's the plan. I'm going to close this out with a beautiful passage of Scripture. And I pray that you hear the wonder and the glory of the return to innocence that's available to you as God is making a bride that is perfect and spotless for the bridegroom. In Romans 5, and I want to read this entire text. For if we were all God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Amen. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The truth about nakedness, that awareness, 
that heavy weight of the consequence of our behaviors and our actions, let me tell you, the cross of Christ is present for you that you might receive the mercy and the grace of God and to walk forth clean before your Lord, innocent again, with the Spirit dwelling in you to help you walk in righteousness. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's the blessing that God has for you. Would you pray with me? Lord, I'm thankful that by your sacrifice that our sins are covered. I'm thankful that by your resurrection there's power over the death factor and the disease factor and the sin factor and the eternal gloom factor and the separation from God factor. I'm thankful that new life, eternal life, that life that was, would be by the biting of the tree of life. You are the tree of life, Lord God, and you offer it, Jesus, to us. May we take it, that our sins might be cleansed, that our hearts might be made pure, that our minds might be sanctified. We come to you, Lord Jesus, and say thank you, and we give our life to you. Cover our sins. May they be tossed as far as the east is from the west to the bottom of the ocean, never to be remembered any longer. And make us like you as your Holy Spirit guides us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Excited about going through Genesis with you. Pray that you're blessed by it. Uh, thank you again. Uh, your generosity last month in the Nourishing Network was outstanding. I'm, I'm never surprised. You're a generous church. You are so faithful. And uh, the Nourishing Network was very blessed by your gifts over the course of the month of January. Um, I think that's all of our announcements, other than the fact that I'm not sure the date of Marjorie's 90th birthday, the 26th. So Marjorie's a sweetheart that <clears throat> comes and June picks her up, or Earl picks her up, and if you don't know Marjorie, you're missing out. But she turns 90. So we're going to celebrate that. You know, I, I know that uh, Thelma is going to be turning 99, and somehow, Tommy, we're going to have to bless her because that's a beautiful thing too. There's an offering uh, place. Put your offering there, and if you're watching online, it'll, it'll be on the screen. And as an act of closing today, I'd like us to stand. And am I looking around to see him anywhere? Is Dr. Dan present? He's gone to quarantine. That's right, he went. Uh, Dr. Dan, you know him. Uh, he's a blessed brother here. He um, has to quarantine because he's going into surgery for his heart. And Several things have been going off in the last couple of weeks and quite concerned for him. So church, would you join me in praying for our brother? Lord, you are a giver of good gifts and Dr. Dan Timmons is one of them. You are a faithful God and Holy Spirit, one of your gifts and one of your fruits is faith. And Dr. Dan is abundant in those, that fruit. He's a blessing. He does things to your glory at all times. In his 90s, he's still working faithfully around the church and doing certain things and yard work and garbage, all these things behind the scenes that no one really knows about, but he's a gift. You know, he's struggling in the last several weeks. Something's not quite right, Lord God. And Lord, I know that he's going in for a review on his pacemaker and working with the heart and the blood flow that goes into his brain. And I'm asking for your hand upon the physicians to find out what's going on here so we have a better flow of oxygen, clarity in his mind. Be with him during quarantine. He's not wired for that. He's always out and about. So God, give him strength in this time. There are many out there, Lord God, who are going through these type of things. May your hand of mercy be upon them. Your strength undergird them. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, family. Have a great week.
Go and know that if you're tempted, you have every, everything you need to say no. Say no! <laughs> God bless.